Okay, so what I'm going to do um, in uh, my 20 minutes is just give you a bit of a sense, um, national perspective from the Care Quality Commission, um, but focusing obviously on adult social care because we've had a lot about um, uh, health systems and, and the health service and I think that we need to expand that out and I'll explain why I think that's so important. Obviously, I think it's so important because that's my job. Um, but why I think it's so important for everybody else as well. And to think, um, uh, just to give you a bit of a taster as to the work that I'm going to be doing around adult social care and the priorities for the CQC over the next few months, but really dwelling upon the vision and approach that I think that we need to have um, in adult social care and the, the link uh, to integration, um, which has been mentioned by both of my previous colleagues. Um, so, hopefully this particular slide is not a surprise to anybody in the audience. And the Care Quality Commission has been doing a tremendous amount of work um, over the last few months to redefine our purpose and to be absolutely clear about our role. And one of the things that I would like to say, um, and particularly to this audience, is it is not the role of the Care Quality Commission to make sure that every single day, day in, day out, quality care is delivered um, and, and that systems and processes are put in place to make that happen. That's actually all of your responsibility as people who are providing services um, and people who are commissioning and funding services. Um, and I don't think that we should be setting ourselves up to fail as the people who are going to make that happen on the ground. But what we can do is work with you to make sure that that happens across the health and social care service. And one of the things that I want to see regulation being um, for health and adult social care is an inspiration to all of you that have got the tough job at the sharp end um, of delivering care, both in terms of running um, services or commissioning them. And that we need to be there to work with you in the way that we monitor, inspect and regulate those services to make sure that the citizens um, uh, who rely upon the work that you do can actually have confidence in what it is um, that you are doing. And one of the ways um, that we are going to be doing that, and again, I hope that this is familiar to most of you, is that um, in the future, we are going to be focusing the way that we inspect, regulate, and the way that we rate services on five key questions. And I couldn't have hoped for a better example than Tim's about his colonoscopy for us to be thinking about kind of how would we be able to answer these questions if we'd asked that about that service. So the questions that we're going to be asking are, is the service safe? Is it effective? Is it caring? Is it responsive to people's needs? And is it well led? And so let's take Tim's example. Is it safe? He's got a risk of um, colon cancer in his family. Is waiting over a year um, when actually one of the things that we know, and Anne was saying this earlier, um, late diagnosis is a particular issue in this country. Is it effective? Is it an effective use of his, of, of his time um, uh, 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 and resources and the resources um, of the organisations that he was um, uh, trying to kind of you know, crawl through in all of that um, in, in terms of actually uh, the, the, the merry-go-round that he had to go on? And is it effective in terms of what the outcome might be if, God forbid, the worst thing um, had happened? I cannot even begin to believe that that is caring in terms of the way that actually an individual um, and somebody as important as Tim um, was treated um, as a widget um, in a widget factory in terms of uh, somebody um, going their way through the system. And it certainly wasn't responsive to people's needs. And I don't think that uh, an organisation that lets that happen um, could call itself well led. So I think that we've had a real life example there, um, and we didn't practice this beforehand, um, a real life example of how our questions from the Care Quality Commission can actually really get under the skin of the way that services um, are delivered and organized to actually find out what's happening and what we need to be doing about it to make it better for people. 
So that's our new operating model, um, you know, going through the, the basic stages of the registration, making sure that that is a rigorous test. And in adult social care, that's absolutely critical for us. It is um, our largest sector that we're regulating, and it is our fastest growing. And so there are new people coming into um, uh, adult social care all the time. And we need to be making sure that they absolutely understand what it is that we're expecting of them when they um, sign up to the legally binding um, registration that we ask of them. We are going to um, be working um, on our surveillance and insight um, into the information that we've got available around um, health and social care, working with colleagues in NHS England, but also in local authorities. Um, and I've already had conversations with the Association of Director of Adult Social Services, and Paul was there in the, in the room when we were starting to have this conversation about saying, you know, we need to be sharing information better. We need to be making sure that um, from the care quality Commission, we're making the best use of the, um, uh, the information that is available so that we can target the inspections um, that we're taking forward and make sure that we're able to answer those questions that I've already gone through. But what we'll also be doing is making sure that those inspections are, 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 are expert, um, are led by experts. And you know that Mike Richards is already um, uh, taking that forward. In fact, he's out um, inspecting today in London. Um, and we've had some great uh, insight from uh, what Bruce Keogh did earlier this year in, in the review of the 14 trusts that he looked at. And I am thinking through, and I'll be launching a document tomorrow, signposting the way that we're going to be taking things forward in adult social care, how we can learn from that experience and how we make sure um, that um, uh, our, our inspectors do have the expertise and the ability to get under the skin of the service. And one very important way that we're going to do that um, in adult social care is by expanding the use um, of people who have a personal experience of care either because they're using services themselves or because they have cared for somebody who has used services. And so our experts by experience, we've already got some of them on the books, but we're looking to expand that and to make that um, a, a, a more integral part of what we do. And I'm absolutely with Tim on, on the transparency, and one of the critical things that we're going to be doing is publishing a rating um, for hospital services, but also for adult social care and for primary care. And I think that um, backing all of that up is the action that we will take if we need to take, um, uh, if we come across um, areas where um, it's not, care is not as it should be. But that's the overarching picture. It's been set out in the strategy document the CQC launched earlier this year, um, uh, developed a little bit further um, by Mike Richards in the consultation, a new start um, in, uh, uh, in early summer. We will follow that structure in adult social care. But I am very conscious, as I'm sure most of you are in this room, that adult social care is not an acute hospital. It is different in very many respects, and we have to actually take those um, particular characteristics into account when we are designing and developing the approach that we're going to be taking. So you've got the slide. I'm sure you'll see these slides elsewhere. I won't go uh, on and on about every last bullet point. But fundamentally, this is about people's whole lives. It's not episodic. You know, it's dreadful if you go in and out of hospital and, 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 and you didn't have a good experience. But actually, if you are at home, a vulnerable person, and somebody is coming into your home, um, uh, and sometimes doing the most intimate and personal of, uh, uh, of things with you, you, know, you need to feel safe and secure. You need to be treated with care and compassion. Um, and we need to be thinking about how we get to the heart of that in what we do. The second thing that I draw out is the different nature of adult social care. And here I take um, a, a little bit of issue with um, some of, my, uh, some of uh, the things that um, Mark and Tim said because they concentrated very much on the health service working with local authorities. We have to go much broader than that. The adult social care sector has a very diverse provider um, uh, market, a very significant um, voluntary um, and private sector in that market. And we have to be absolutely working with colleagues across health and local authorities, but that needs to extend out into um, the provider uh, sector as well. And particularly, 
because there are so many people who are funding their own care in adult social care. Nearly 50% of people in nursing homes uh, and care homes um, uh, are funding their own care. Differs in different parts of the country, um, but across the board that is the case. So I think that we need to be thinking about um, uh, uh, how, we, how we draw our net very widely in the work that we do. And finally, I'd, uh, be, we have to be absolutely clear that in adult social care, you know, we um, don't have as much guidance standards as we do uh, in the health service. I've worked for both the National Institute for Health and, and Care Excellence, as, as they are now, and the Social Care Institute for Excellence. And despite the fact that both organisations have been running for pretty much similar periods of time, there's a lot more nice guidance than there is sky guidance. There's a lot more understanding of what it is um, that we should be doing in health. And that's the reason why the expert um, inspections from our inspectors are so important and using them and our experts by experience so that we can focus on choice, balancing risk um, and, and uh, embracing personalisation. So I'm um, a week into the job. Um, I started last Monday, um, <laughs> which uh, um, I'm, I, I feel like I had probably been doing two jobs for the last couple of months of the time that I was at Sky. And, and I have identified five key priorities that I'm going to be taking forward and will be in the document that we're launching tomorrow. So first and foremost, trying to sort out the new inspection regime, making it clear how we're going to take that forward. From that, developing the ratings. The Care Bill at the moment um, um, is suggesting that um, the Care Quality Commission will have market oversight of some of the larger providers, we reckon about 50 to 60, where if there was financial failure there, it would not be possible for local authorities to, um, uh, uh, to respond um, at a local level. We need a coordinated um, uh, role there, and, and the CQC, um, pending the passage of the bill, will have that. But I think it's really important for us to concentrate on developing our people and making sure um, uh, that they can deliver on these priorities and that we build confidence in what we do at the Care Quality Commission so that people who use services, their carers, families and the public can indeed rely upon what we're doing. But we need to do that with all of you, both as providers, commissioners and national stakeholders, so that we can truly be the embodiment um, of, of, of of what the strategy for CQC sets out, that we will be on the side of people who are using services. And what I'd like to kind of bring this into is the mum test. Um, and it's not just my mum, it's any member of my family, depending on um, which service we're looking at. And the question is, um, is this service good enough for my mum or your mum? or your dad, or your brother, sister, child, whatever. And if it is good enough, then that's fantastic. And we should celebrate that and we should promote it. Again, I'm with Mark, kind of, we, we have all of the bad things kind of um, uh, highlighted uh, uh, about what's wrong with our health and care system. There's some fantastic care out there. There are some brilliant staff doing some amazing work. And we need to be positive about that because we need more of them to come and work with us. Um, but equally, if it's not good enough for my mum, it's not good enough for anybody's mum. And we need to do something about it. And we, all of us in this room, need to be doing something about it. But I need to be doing something about it as the Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care. And you can be absolutely convinced that I will. So I was asked to, um, uh, the, the, to, to, to reflect upon you know, what could adult social care learn from the patient-centred approaches that um, Tim um, was going to be talking about. And when I was having my briefing session with NHS England staff about this, I kind of have to confess that I went a bit, uh-huh, you know, we've been doing this for a blooming long time in, uh, in adult social care, and we call it co-production. Um, and it truly is about engaging with professionals and citizens absolutely in the design of the systems within which um, that care and support is provided, but also their individual experience as well. Um, and um, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, there's a fantastic little video um, called The Blobs and the Squares. If you look on Google for the parable of the blobs and the squares and spend five, five or six minutes watching that, you'll get it. Um, 
and it's absolutely integral to what we do in adult social care. It's person-centred, coordinated care involving people who are, in, uh, uh, who, who, who are directly affected. But, you know, as we've already heard, we cannot do this by ourselves, either from an adult social care perspective or from a health perspective. Integration with other services is absolutely critical, and that's health, housing, communities. Um, and I knew that I'd be following Tim, so I knew he'd have something whizzy and lovely. So I thought I'd have something whizzy and lovely too, um, and I've nicked it from the King's Fund. So could we just play that quick video, um, Sam's story around integration? Thank you. Over the next 20 years, the number of over 85s in the UK will more than double, meaning many more of us with multiple long-term health conditions. Our current health and social care system won't cope. Fundamentally, it's the same system as when the NHS was set up, designed to treat episodes of illness one at a time. Already, we're failing to give vulnerable people the care they need, and we're set to run out of money fast. Meet Sam. He's 87 and suffers from emphysema a disease that makes it hard to breathe, and also has type 2 diabetes and arthritis. Sam was coping pretty well until his wife passed away, but is now lonely and increasingly depressed. Sam frequently visits his GP, but finds it difficult to discuss all his needs in a brief consultation. If Sam can't get hold of his GP in a crisis, he calls for an ambulance. Each time, Sam spends time in A&E, and he's often transferred to a ward as well. He sees lots of different healthcare professionals and has to explain his conditions repeatedly. Frustrating. And Sam often has to wait to be assessed by social services before he can go home. The result? A lot of unnecessary time in hospital. And when he gets home, a lack of coordination between his GP and social care often means he doesn't get the support he needs. Eventually, after several hospital visits in just six months, it's decided to admit Sam to a care home. But what if Sam's health and social care services were more joined up? Let's imagine one of Sam's carers is given overall responsibility for coordinating his care. For example, Kathy, a district nurse. Kathy meets with Sam, his GP and his social worker. Sam explains that he wants to manage his conditions at home, and together they design a care plan which they can all access online anytime. Sam now gets more visits from Kathy at home, which helps him manage his emphysema and diabetes. On the occasions when he does have a crisis, Sam calls Kathy rather than an ambulance, so goes to hospital less frequently. And even when he is admitted, he's discharged after a quick review of his care plan rather than having to be reassessed. In this scenario, Sam's health and social care is funded from a joint budget, so the team can make smart decisions about how it's spent and call on the help of other social services. For example, as his condition deteriorates, the team decide to fit a seat in Sam's shower, provide him with an oxygen cylinder to ease his breathing, as well as a medication dispenser with a voice prompt to remind him to take his pills. Kathy talks to Sam about his loneliness, and he agrees to weekly trips to the shops with a volunteer from a local befriending charity. So now, Sam doesn't have to be admitted to a care home, instead getting the help he needs in his home. He feels happier, is healthier, and better use has been made of resources within the system. Let's recap on what transforms Sam's care. Put simply, local leaders in the NHS, social services and the voluntary sector created a shared vision of what good, integrated care looked like, centred around the needs of people like Sam and their carers. They pooled resources across health and social care, built multi-professional teams and created systems to allow Sam's information to be easily shared. Sound idealistic? Well, this is actually already happening in a few places. Now it's time to make sure it happens everywhere. Let's reimagine how we provide care. Get inspired at kingsfund.org.uk forward slash joined up care. Thank you. Um, so if we can go back to the... Um, <clears throat> I obviously nicked that from the King's Fund, but it absolutely chimes with um, work that we did at the Social Care Institute for Excellence, which we published last year, um, uh, which again, if you fancy a good read, is research briefing number 41, available on the website. Um, and it's a 20-page document, but actually I think it boils down into five key things, um, which kind of, I think, take your 10 um, uh, uh, points, um, Mark, um, uh, probably, and just, just group them slightly differently. But it's, as was explained in the film, clarity of vision, defined roles and responsibilities, 
good information sharing and good communications between people. Um, the important and valuable role of leadership, and that's not just senior leaders, that's leaders at every um, uh, level um, in, in, the, in the service. But it's also about thinking about culture. You know, I've worked in both health and social care, and frankly, we sometimes talk different languages, and I've often felt that I've been an interpreter when I've been in the room with both sets of tribes. Um, and we need to actually be thinking about how we make that work more proactively um, in the future. And we know that it does. There's a fantastic good practice example um, on the Sky website and the Social Care TV around avoiding unnecessary hospital admissions um, from a residential home where um, a new res uh, registered manager came in, was absolutely horrified about the numbers of the residents, many of whom had dementia, um, who were ending up in accident and emergency because his staff were not capable and confident of looking after people within the home. And there were a variety of things that were put in place absolutely critical was the joint work um, uh, with the local health system, both the mental health trust as well as GPs, um, and a really good focus on some of the things that were absolutely necessary, like, like good nutrition. And it did indeed transform what happened to the experience of people um, within that nursing home. So as the King's Fund said, it does happen, it can happen, sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that it is indeed possible. So finally, how can the CQC help around all of this? And I think, you know, actually, that's part of what you're talking about today is how do all of these different organisations work together? And I think that the Care Quality Commission has got to be seen as part of the solution with you, not part of um, the problem or the yoga sitting over your, sh your shoulder. So, as I said before, regulation for inspiration. We need to be encouraging people to improve services. Yes, we will celebrate and promote what's good. Um, we will um, help to improve the standard and we will try and eliminate, eliminate the unacceptable. Um, but actually, I can't be doing that on a daily basis. That's what you guys out there need to be doing. And I hope that the way that we will set the standards and the way that we will rate services will encourage and support you. We need to be practicing what we preach as well. Um, and uh, in coming into the Care Quality Commission, um, I am bringing and really trying to focus the language of co-production in what we do. Actually, the CQC has done a lot of engagement in the past and, and, and a lot of consultation, but what we're going to be doing over the next few months, particularly in adult social care, is working with people to design what the um, regulation uh, function for the, uh, for, for the future is going to be. But that's not something that we just need to focus on in adult social care. We need to do this across the, uh, across the board. And so I want to make sure that we're asking the right questions about integration, regardless of the service um, that we're inspecting and regulating. And that those questions about integration should be informing our inspectors' judgments and ratings. And that will be most evident, I think, in the themed inspections that we'll be taking forward. Um, the next one up is around dementia care but fundamentally what we are going to be concentrating on is people-centered coordinated care and if that's what you're doing too then I think together we're all part of the solution so I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and if you liked anything of what I had to say there you can follow me on Twitter at Crouch and Tiger number seven thank you very much